Okay. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was a pretty quick changeover from uh, a very interesting masterclass on, uh, on Google. There will be a test afterwards on all of those uh, URLs. Now we're changing gear again in our uh, last session of the morning before lunch. Uh, we're going to go to a panel discussion uh, looking at digital transformation and, uh, and the world of the SME. So how really large and small can work together. Um, and we're also going to look at you know, what proves it give us some proof points, have a discussion, and ask questions. So it's going to be our usual panel format. Uh, I'm going to ask the chairman, uh, Ian Patson, to introduce himself and uh, let the team introduce them themselves, ask some starting discussion questions with the panel themselves, and then throw it open to, to the audience in the usual way. So with that said, Ian, over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. I see you're a bit fuller than the panel we had yesterday, which is good. Um, so hopefully it keeps you entertained and also making informative for you as well. So a bit of background about uh, myself. I'm seconded in from Government Digital Services um, into DVLA as their CTO. As you may be aware that Government Digital Services have a very strong uh, SME, small media enterprise, agenda to drive more innovation and create um, that innovative, if you like, attitude through the organisations via the use of SMEs. Because we believe that predominantly, if you have smaller organisations, that you actually they have to have innovation in order to survive. They have new ideas. They're trying to drive a business forward. And as organisations become very large, in fact, on a global scale, and acquire other organisations, potentially they can actually absorb that innovation in order to maintain, if you like, their business and to keep that business flowing and reselling the same models. So there is a very clear agenda within government. I, I also would say that in DVLA we've really worked that, I think, to, to a very good degree, but it is about having a balance in my mind. It's about balancing off where the big players are and the skills are in that and actually driving pockets of innovation through the SME agenda. Um, and also, I would say it's fair to say that the large organisations working with the SMEs, as hopefully we hear some of that today, are seeing benefits themselves around how they restructure themselves and organise themselves to fit with the new digital agenda and digital transformation, not only in government, but I think you know, across businesses as a whole. So I'm going to pass it over to Alan if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, I'm Martin Britton from Natural Resources Wales. So um, we're Wales' largest non-governmental organisation and we've got just over 2,000 staff. Um, early on, uh, we, uh, well, we were inaugurated in April 2013 and we, we took a decision very early on to do our ICT ourselves so we don't use a large system integrator. Um, consequently, what we've done is really embodied what GDS preach and that's to use SMEs wherever possible for project work. So we're an, we're an embodiment of, of the GDS strategy in that sense and that's worked out really well for us over the last couple of years. Um, so I'll pass across now. Hello, I'm Matt Howell, and uh, I work for Capgemini, and I run uh, the Public Services Division. So I'm, I'm one of the large systems integrators that Gary didn't use. Um, we, we use a lot of uh, small to medium enterprises because they make us stronger and they make us better. Um, and, and hopefully we'll talk about that uh, as we go through the panel. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Rob Rolly. I'm from General Dynamics, one of those large defense guerrillas. Um, my role in the company is uh, the technology director and I run our open innovation facility and what that allows us to do is to reach out to those SMEs and actually work collaboratively with them and ideally bring some of that technology into our, our solutions because we recognize that you know, no matter how big our, own, our research and development budgets are, there's an awful lot going on out there and there's an awful lot going on out there that's really relevant to our business. I say I'm a defense contractor, defense, i.e. telecommunications, and the problems and the challenges and the issues that we're having with big data, human factors, don't forget there's a human in the loop, all of these things that we're starting to see today, some of the evolutions that's out there in these small companies have a direct place in futures, uh, excuse me, in our systems of tomorrow. So that's what I do through our innovation facility. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much. Can I just ask within the audience how many people here are from the SME community? Just a show of hands, roughly. Right. And how many people here are people that would consume the SME services? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So just get a ba balance of the, the sort of people we've got across the audience to give a flavour to some of the questions perhaps we should be asking what we might expect later. So um, I think we've talked about the you know, 
in a sense, the, the, the views that we have and how you tend to be using them and what you might get from it. I probably want to extrapolate that a bit further. So I realise that government has forced the issue to some extent. And it's fair to say that if in the past, I think, organisations, large organisations, would look at uh, SMEs as a form of where they've got an idea, we'll acquire them. And it's slightly different. To, I, mean, I don't think that will go away. But to be perfectly honest, I think that will still happen over time. But um, how do you draw? What is the strengths you're drawing from SMEs? And what are the things you're learning from that? If I can open that up. I'll ask you first if you've got the mic. <laughs> I've got the microphone. Um, the, st the strengths that we've got from SMEs, I mean, we're a large company, uh, a large multinational company, and that comes with benefits, and it also comes with challenges in terms of how dynamic the organization is. Um, Big companies like to be like small companies because they like that agility. An acquisition goes some way to that, but you often find that when you acquire a company, you get the agility, but after a while, it then kind of transmogrifies into the, the big beast. So what's attractive to me is, is picking up that agility that you've got and the dynamism in the small company. We, we, we carefully select through a kind of an interview process or a dialogue, and it really is a, a two-way dialogue, of finding a company that's got a capability that could be of use to us. And I think the smart thing that, that, that we do, and, and this has been copied by others and, and it's quite straightforward, is that we actually try that technology in our environment. And, and what that allows them to do is that we've got a large bunch of engineers. Um, I've got about 500 engineers in Wales. And those engineers cover a variety of disciplines, you know, all sorts of things. So if we've got a new technology that's coming into the business, I can find someone that can support it and work with that SME to test it. Does it do what it says on the tin? Does it do what our customers would like it to do? We've got capability and facilities that the SME doesn't have access to. So we can really bring it in and kick the tires. And I think what comes out of that is that for the SME, it says actually, well, that technology that we've got, you know, it's not quite good enough and we need to go away and, and do this or, do you know, there's something in there that we can develop or actually, when we put these two things together and start them, integrate them together, we can see how we need to develop that project forward. And then, when they go for funding, they've got a potential market opportunity which helps them. So, the magic for me is the large company can bring those resources together to support that small company but the, the, the real thing it needs, and the, the only way it succeeds, is if there's a defined customer need. I've got something that's needed, otherwise it's technology for technology's sake, and I, and I think that's just wasting everybody's time. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to pick up on that last point, um, what, what digital is enabling us to do is, is to affect business transformations and, and, and deliver business value. And, and, and they tend to be uh, wide-reaching and large and, and therefore potentially risky. I think any company who, who says that they can end-to-end -end provide the very best of everything in a transformation like that um, is, is simply being disingenuous. There are uh, technologists, there are people who can help with the process and the people change who are frankly better than we are. Um, and, and so for me, SMEs, uh, it's, it's in our DNA, it's in Capgemini's DNA, we've been doing it for many years. Um, if anyone's had the pleasure of filling in a tax form, um, it, it, you may or may not know that that, that is or was an SME um, uh, who provided that about 10 years ago. Uh, they were subsequently purchased, but, but not by us. So it's in our DNA, and, and, and what SMEs do is to make us stronger. They improve my brand because they deliver innovation. They improve my delivery because they allow us to do things with less risk and to make more profit both for the firm um, uh, but also for, for us. Um, so I think for us, it, it, it's, it's, I can't really overstate how important it is to, to, for us to identify, and we might touch on that later, how we can do that, but to identify, to work with SMEs fairly and equitably to help deliver our business transformations because I was struck by something that David Howell said earlier on, um, if, if anyone was in that, uh, in that session, and that's that when large companies like mine have an SME and they work and deliver innovation, we're really, really grateful. Uh, and we are, because we can't possibly spend the R&D to do what we need to do to affect what we are doing for our customers and to do that going forward. I have a slightly different view, actually. Um, as I said, we engage with SMEs directly, uh, typically for line of business applications. Um, 
of course, for the agility, both with an A and, and a large A as well. Um, and I think the primary reason for us doing that is uh, we, we gain a lot of benefits that the SI doesn't bring. We contract directly, the costs are much less. And in a sense, um, necessity has been the mother of invention with public spending cuts as well. So we don't really see the role of the large SI in our organisation anymore. And we contract with the SMEs directly and we put the enterprise picture together ourselves and integrate with, with the SMEs on a one-to-one -one basis. So the risks that people used to say in the past are what if this SME disappears and goes out of business? Well, actually, that risk applies whether you contract them directly or through an SI. Uh, you still lose that skill set. Or if the other risk that people mention is what if the SME only has two or three developers and one of them leaves? Again, I've had that happen to me when using the large SI as well. And somebody comes in off the bench who doesn't know the project and has the same learning curve. So I think the risks of using SMEs are exactly the same as using a large SI. And I think with public spending cuts as they are, I think the role of the large SI is going to diminish over time, I'm afraid, chaps. I mean, Martin, I just want to, uh, to draw that out a bit further. I mean, we're doing the same thing within Diva Layers in, in sourcing and supplementing that with the, the SME community. I think, though, that, 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 that there seems to be a very much an us and them relationship sometimes with the, the SMEs versus the big SI. Yeah, there is an agenda that talks about risk, and that sometimes is within the organisations, as in the organisations consuming the services, and part of the digital transformation is the risk, if you put it with a large SI, means that you're protected because the SI will do the job, or we could sue them. They never do, and usually it's around the scope, and it's usually the poor information given by the client in order to effect the transformation, rather than actually having a big SI there. I think it's difficult to, to educate organisations and businesses around the real risk profile versus the use of SMEs or the use of SIs in the correct way. Uh, some things that we've started to do, for example, are to use the SI as resource augmentation whilst we start to educate ourselves to be the better client. And I think we always get poor SIs, always had them, because we were poor clients. We weren't informed. Um, but how do we get past, do you think, the, the us versus them piece within the large SI world and the use of the SME? Because we've heard how that there's a collaborative piece of working, but some of that collaborative piece of working is within the envelope of um, organisations using them themselves, rather than working in harmony with other organisations where they're using the SI and the SME. How have you got past that? Well, I think um, if I start off there, I think the, um, the primary issue you highlighted there is the, is the intelligent customer role. And the role the SI can play is to help to elucidate those requirements from the business and then to inform the SME um, of, of the requirements uh, that the business needs. But to be honest, what we've done there is rather than use an SI in this instance, we've used independent contractors to work alongside the business within the business units proper business analyst professionals who can write a decent set of requirements, which then we can go to G Cloud with and procure an SME in that sense. So we've been educating the business along the way and upskilling them, but using independent contractors a sort of £400 a day rather than SI resource at £1,000, £1,200 a day. So a similar sort of principle, but a different value for money presentation. Okay. I'll, I'll let you respond there from the, uh, from the SI side of the world. Well, well it's going to surprise you, but, but I'm going to agree with Martin. Um, I, I think there are organisations which will choose to, to direct uh, contract with SMEs. Uh, there are organisations which will contract to an SI, and, and, and most, we're finding, will do a hybrid. Um, big supporter of G Cloud myself. Um, uh, we do a lot of business off it. And, and I think what I would never do is to use an SME where I couldn't add value. If uh, and not, not long ago, someone came and spoke to me, described their product. It was in a customer that we, that we work with. And, and in the end, and he said, can we work through? And in the end, I said, well, what I'll do is to go and make an introduction to the customer. I can add no value to what you're doing except to add 10% for risk. And that isn't helping them, and it isn't helping me. But what did help me is that I introduced them to our customer. And, and now that customer's pleased because part of my job is to bring innovation and to construct an ecosystem of, of supply that best meets their customer needs. And, and so I, I, do, I do agree, we, we shouldn't be working if we're not adding value. I'm a great believer in market forces. If we're not adding value, people are not going to choose us. So, so I think that's one thing. If I can just give a couple of examples. Um, I think a lot of SMEs, in fact, I know a lot of SMEs like to work through SIs. They tell me that many parts of government are quite large 
and confusing to deal with. Um, G Cloud's really helped with bidding, but a lot of very, very large programs will still and always require large bids. We can help with that. There is an element of taking risk um, as well. So, so I think... I, th I think it shouldn't be us and them. Just one last thing, by the way. Um, we have a quarterly meeting with Mark Durnley and HMRC, which is called, um, I think, the SME Council, where we go and we talk about how we are bringing SMEs into an ecosystem, either direct into HMRC or through us. So uh, I don't think there needs to be an us and them. Uh, there probably needs to be a pendulum swing to get a better ecosystem. But, but uh, you know, I'm a supporter in working together, collaborating, where we add value to each other's services. Hello. Yeah, just like to add, it's about the balance. Um, we're, we're one of those large system integrators, and our customer is a UK MOD. And for an SME to deliver a, a multi-million pound tactical communication system to the MOD, that's kind of difficult. But what we can offer, and we talked about those requirements, um, our customer is very specific. I don't know if anybody's ever look to any military specs or any military requirements. They make really great bedtime reading, but they're kind of really thick and volumetric and detailed down to the last nth degree of how high you should be able to drop it on the floor before it breaks, how much water ingress it is, what particular color of green it should be. But actually in that sometimes gets lost what actually the end user wants it to do. And I think where we work well and have had great successes is that where we've created an environment where we can bring this innovative technology that's bubbling out there in the SME community, put it in a context that our end customer wants and demonstrates the art of the possible. And that's when you get those really interesting conversations that go on between the end user, the end customer that says, that's really good. Can it do this? And wouldn't it be good if it could do that? That's, you know, that's exactly what it wants, we wanted to do. Can it do that? Now, those requirements may be in volume one or volume two or volume 10, but are not expressed as clear as that. And I think by creating something with technology rapidly that shows the art of the possible, that is where the magic comes from me. And that then presents that opportunity that didn't exist before. And we've had a number of examples where we've worked with SMEs that, that are, you know, come up with some innovative solutions that aren't often rocket, well, sometimes aren't rocket science, that just package things something in a different way. Because I said at the beginning, there's a human in the loop, and some of that technology makes things simpler or easier or lighter or more easy to use for our users. So don't forget, it's all about digital, yes, but sometimes that innovation isn't rocket science, it's some of the simple stuff that brings through that supply chain and gets delivered. So the magic for me is working, it's providing that SI framework, an opportunity that the SME perhaps wouldn't have had on his own for our particular custom. So I suppose I'm in a similar space to Martin with that and that um, um, a real example for us is the DLA are building a, they call it a motoring services platform, a digital services platform which is a series of tools pulled together in a certain way that allows us to work very quickly in an agile manner and we'll start to use that to replace our, our legacy systems with new digital services. Um, so it's, what is interesting there is that is only, we've got a hybrid mix there of organizations or, or resources, I should say, that are in the, um, the SI world, i.e. our incumbent supply chain, the people that are there at the moment maintaining our legacy systems, mixed with the SME, but with the disciplines are our own disciplines and those of the, the SME environment. In fact, we moved them into the tech hub and away from our usual environments, so they, they are totally unencumbered by the processes of the SI. How do you release the innovation while still having a large organization and your processes, methods around it? And how do you prevent, dare I say, your commercial people getting involved to make sure that your own organizations aren't disadvantaged by the innovation that's coming through the SME environment? Absolutely great question, and absolutely, you've got it on the head. I mean, you said commercial department and innovation in the same sentence. I mean, that really takes the biscuit. But I mean, the, the way that we've achieved it is by that precise separation. We have a physical separate entity where we collaborate with the SMEs. I mean, we're in the security business, so there might be instances where you know that, that has its own challenges. So we have a 
created a physical separate entity, our own laboratory, our own engagement space, where we can work. And the commercial construct is simple. It's a simple five-step process. We identify, and that is the key thing I mentioned, the need. There has to be a real customer need for doing something. Once we've got that need, we say, okay, we need one of those. We will then go out and find someone that has one of those. And there's no easy way of doing that. And it is a lot of networking, talking. You can Google till your heart's content, but you won't find the real thing that you're looking for until you actually spend some time with the person. So you find the thing, you find the people, you then say, okay, we're going to, have to do a little project together and we're going to do it quickly and we're going to do it in about six to 12 weeks because, do you know, if you can't do it in six to 12 weeks, that thing isn't quite ready yet. I don't care if it's too big, it's not quite fast enough, I can't drop it off the ceiling. If you've got a prototype that looks like it can do what we need to do, let's do a project around it rapidly and we'll end with a demonstration. Great. That's what we do. We sign up for that, no money changes hands, IP is protected, we go off and do that project. Now, that then triggers an awful lot of interaction. And there has been many occasion, the night before, or two hours before the demonstration, in our facilities, where you walk in and say, how are you going, guys? And you can just tell that the laptops are out, there are people cracking code, and perhaps that how you going, guys, wasn't quite the good question to ask at that moment in time. But you see engineers working with engineers putting this thing together. Our engineers solving problems that those guys have got, we're learning from those people. The demonstration will go ahead. Coming out of that is that learning experience that that SME has had. They've had exposure to what it's like to work in an environment. They've got exposure to our customer and they can see if that technology works in that environment. So in answer to the question, how do I deal with the constraints around it? Create a separate commercial entity have a separate physical thing, and do it in rapid time. Yeah, and just, um, uh, I'll just add a little bit to that. I, I, I feel uh, the need to, to reinforce what you've said about commercial, um, and, uh, com commercial innovation, that, that well-known oxymoron. But, but for me, it is, it, it, certainly our commercial people, what will they look at? They will look at the reduction of risk. If I can show in any given delivery model that, that using SMEs is going to increase the quality of our delivery and reduce our risk, why would they not like that as much as I do? So, so that, that, that's, that's one thing. And I, and I think, in answer directly to your question, that there isn't a single prescription for this. It, it could be that um, uh, there would be no systems integrator involved, just working with, with your in-house people and under your direction, your intelligent customer direction. You may have a hybrid. You know, let, let's say you're migrating off of VME. Not many SMEs are, are currently developing VME capabilities, so you may want someone like us to work with you to, to, to make that happen. Or, or in, in some circumstances, you may just be working with an SI. So I, I think it's incumbent upon upon us as systems integrators, upon the SME community, but also the customer to pick the right models for the right programs. And, and if I just mention one, which, uh, which was, we hear a lot about government failures in IT. If we think of a big government success in HMRC, that was delivered, of course, by HMRC and by Capgemini and by over 20% SME community. And, and that was one of the largest, as Ian will know, one of the largest, most complex programs in government today. And it was delivered with the right delivery model. And, and I think that's the important thing, to pick it in terms of pragmatic right solution rather than any specific predisposition to, to going to one delivery, uh, delivery model. Can I just stick with, if I stick with uh, uh, Matt and Rob a minute on that one? Because what I'm finding is that most of the SME hybrid approaches appear to be, obviously from my point of view, and it's probably very selfish within the government sector, the public sector, because the system integrated, the SI, is already the, um, the incumbent supplier, and therefore that's been worked in that way. Can you give some uh, examples of where, uh, sort of real examples of where you've used them outside of where you're the incumbent supplier and use the SME to drive part of that digital transformation in the organisation? Yeah, um, perhaps I'll kick off and, and, and then you can follow. So um, uh, if, if I, I said at the outset, uh, you know, not only do SMEs help me deliver, but they help me win business, and that's good for me. So if I think of um, a, a particular service that we deliver, um, uh, it is 
it's, it's called T-Police. It helps police forces transform their back offices uh, and then release resources into the front office. So it's a, a business transformation enabled by technology. We bid for that some years ago, um, and uh, it uses Oracle Technologies, matter of record, but it just wasn't clever enough, because if it was, everyone would have done that, and they would have implemented Oracle. What, what we did was to identify uh, an SME, Crown, uh, who work with us, and, and actually, as, as, as you said, they, they provide the magic. They provide a core of that solution which delivers duties management. And, and uh, the, the proof was, was in the pudding because police forces love it. Um, they now use it as a shared service. It's, it's growing. We chose them not because, not out of any largesse, we chose them because they helped us win. Um, uh, they've helped us win further police forces, but I like to think they wouldn't be in those police forces if they hadn't been working with us. Uh, not just because we could afford to bid it, but because working together with our experience of Oracle and our quite in-depth understanding of how police forces work and our ability to affect the business transformation, we, I, I would like to think that, that, that it's been a symbiotic relationship. Um, I, can, I can give an example. Hopefully it's, it's not too technical, but... Um, the Army uses a, a, a tactical communication system, and as part of that communication system, there's um, a, a VHF man pack, basically a rucksack that, that soldiers wear with a, a VHF, a long, long antenna. Now, they've got lots of them. They've been around for a long, long while. They're very reliable. People know how to use them. Training burden is low. As I say, they've got lots of them. And how can you get extra utility out of these? The fundamental problem with them is its VHF radio. So the range isn't particularly great. I mean, it's great in an urban environment. You probably get 10 or 15 kilometers, depends on the, the buildup of, you know, how many buildings, and et cetera, like, et cetera. We were working with a small company that had a, a little box, and uh, it had the ability to take that signal, which is a VHF signal, and translate it up, uh, such that it would then use a commercial satellite signal and then translate it down again. So if you've got this VHF man pack that you know and love and the stores are full of them, you carry this extra little box and just plug it in and that's essentially what you do. And instead of having a 10 to 15 kilometers range, you can communicate anywhere in the world. Now that range extension is fantastic for a logistical burden because you don't then need repeaters, you don't need whatever. So you can have someone on emergency mission, a rescue mission or a humanitarian, a humanitarian aid mission that can get worldwide communication. So that's one example of, of where a little bit of technology has come along. The training burden is low, you know, it, it's this box, I plug it in. The magic is that if you want secure communications, you can't normally have secure communications over a commercial satellite, but actually you've got a secure communications radio and all it's doing is taking that secure communications and broadcasting it over a commercial satellite it is still secure because it is encrypted here. And that system works with that. So that's a little bit of a magic of an SME that provides a little box that, again, is not rocket science, but for the military, they've got a warehouse full of these bloody radios. They can actually now use them to get long-range communication. So that, that's one of those examples. I think one of the things we've, we've found as well is that the, um, the SMEs can bring a lot very quickly. And they're unencumbered by those commercial constraints, etc., and trying to make sure don't put that out of the market because actually we've got something better, we want to keep reselling kind of approach, um, which was happening within large organisations and absolutely that's when you get the mix between commercial and innovation, it doesn't really work very well. Um, what I'm going to ask Martin is that um, we've uh, started to look closely at things which we want to have built. We work on, on the fact that we, we, we as government want to open things up. That means that that intellectual property in effect belongs to the state. So by having you know, open standards, open source, open code, starting to open up data, um, some of the areas which could, we could have concerns, and we've seen it ourselves, where the larger organisations want to say, well, actually, we're in here at the moment, we want something here as non-disclosure, etc., and there still seems to be this tussle over IPR. So I'm wondering how the, um, the SME community cope with that, because sometimes it's their IPR that is being used in that way, and therefore that's of business value to them. So how do you get around the fact of using the SME environment that they can still retain that intellectual property that's theirs? Well, I guess the, the key thing really is to make sure that the services are shareable um, whilst protecting the underlying technology if they have an IPR interest in that. Um, some of our engagements with SMEs as well have been joint, whereby we've shared IPR for as, well, as well, for example. So I think, I, I think whilst respecting 
um, the SMEs need to resell on their technology. At the same time, they have to understand this push towards openness and sharing amongst government as well. So I think you know we both need to come to the table on that one and have a bit of mutual respect in how we transact. Okay. And Matt, can I ask if, if it was a, if it was a, a Cap Gemini working with uh, an SME, um, will they will you own the IPR for that, or will that be something that the SME would retain and be able to reuse themselves and grow their business? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. I can. Uh, uh, I can. I don't think I've ever once tried to negotiate that we own the IPR um, because, yeah, why, why would an SME agree to that? Um, uh, I, I have to say this. I, I have always found the Crown to be rather tougher in IPR negotiations than than Cap Gemini. But what? But anyway, what I can Probably say right. is, <laughs> absolutely. If we work with an SME, what we tend to do is to work on relationships um, both with our customers, but also with our SMEs, if at all possible. And and, and you're not going to get that if, if uh, excuse my French, if you screw them into the ground on the first negotiation. Yeah, I mean uh, the IP is of, of no interest to us whatsoever. I mean it's very very precious to the SME. I mean they've been working, you know, they've mortgaged their house or whatever and created created this thing. I mean what we're interested in is delivering a capability to our customer. Um, you know, that, that SME will probably have a different manufacturing. We're, we're a system integrator. We don't predominantly make lots of stuff. We integrate things. So the magic for us is introducing a new supplier to the supply chain or for the customer having a new capability that provides them with something that they can get value out of. And, and that makes us look good, but also gives us a, a greater offering to future solutions because, you know, mm -hmm. systems are very, very complex with many, many bits in it that extra little widget there might add value to this extra offering. So IP is always protected. We're not interested in it. Okay. I think one of the interesting things for me is we, I think we're still all in the foothills of this digital transformation that, it, that is coming in a sense because it's still evolving and still moving forward. And we're very much at early stages, although, you know, you know we have you know, conferences like this that show there's a lot more and they're growing year on year. But really the advance of it is still quite slow in certain areas, especially where you've got you know, brownfield sites as far as organisations that are changing. And I know that some of the SMEs that we work with in DVLA are actually in the room as well. One of the things that strikes me is the, the ability to create growth plans for that SME community. So how do we actually encourage it? How do we nurture it? And some of our own government processes actually inhibit us from buying things in, in a certain way and make it quite painful because they are designed for the larger organisations that could probably carry some of that pain and carry some of that cost for a period of time. So I'd be interested to open that up to the panel as to how you're creating growth plans for the SME community and what do you think we need to do in order to change the way we work in order to do, take some of that pressure off them and make it easier for them to enter the marketplace. Well, I think a lot of the time, actually, we put barriers um, in front of ourselves that don't need to be there, um, you know, based on a legacy of where we have been in the past, perhaps dealing with large SIs, and we put lots of controls and a really much heavier um, appetite to risk aversion than perhaps we, we realised that we needed to have. And, of course, this was born out of software development practices in the 80s, which have long since changed. So I think it's about making sure that we're appropriate in the level of um, uh, our appetite to risk and also that we use the modern procurement frameworks as well. Um, so, for example, I've seen lots of um, large public sector organisations um, using uh, SIs as a proxy to SMEs when there's perfectly good frameworks in place already, such as the G Cloud, where you can just go direct and have that relationship yourself. And like I said, that risk premium, that 10%, it doesn't pay for anything really. So there's no point, um, in my view, of, of using those older traditional frameworks just because they exist. We need to get our procurement departments you know, to, to get their head in the right place and start using the modern frameworks and transacting, um, like, like GDS have been saying for the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I think there is a transformation going on. I don't think it's probably going on quick enough, but I, I think um, from my side delivering into to large government organisations, the, the, the crushing cost cuts that's going on at the moment and the, the overwhelming desire to deliver more for less for whatever sector you're in, I think is starting to open up and make more attractive some of those models that will allow the SMEs to flourish a little bit more. Whereas before, I think that, that wouldn't have been as, as easy, but I think so against that background, what we're certainly seeing is that, you know, that there's a, a recognition that actually the SMEs have an awful lot to offer and perhaps we need to change some of the procurement rules, regulations, engagement methods to allow that to happen. It's happening, 
whether it's happening quick enough, I think, is a different debate. But it, it's starting to move there. Yeah. I, I, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I, I think we're well on the way with G Cloud uh, and, and things like that. We, we, we have a... Um, I think our, our biggest issue is identifying the SMEs. Once, once we've got them, we can nurture them. We, we, we have um, uh, got, a, got an American firm um, called Iterate who, who help us both identify and nurture and create business plans um, and business opportunities um, for, for triaged uh, SMEs. But, but I was struck this morning, I came down the lift and, and uh, was talking to someone and they, they owned an SME firm. Um, and I said, where did you work? And they said, Heathrow. Now, we, we have an enormous, an enormous um, uh, contract there. Um, do a lot of work, uh, and, and I wasn't aware of them. Um, I've then found out within the space of a 30-second conversation that also um, they're interested in cybersecurity, so are we, um, uh, and, and they're doing a lot in, in digital recruitment, which is a big issue for us to get the right skills through the door. Uh, and I think for me, now I wouldn't, you know, had I not been in the lift at the same time, would have never spoken to him. So I think for me, we can nurture because it's in our interests. This is not largesse, this is this is market forces. It's good for us to nurture and to work with our SMEs and, and to help build business plans. But I think that the thing for me is the identification. And, and I think, again, I, I think that's not just for firms like us. I think that's for our customers as well to, to help us jointly collaborate and, and, and have a, an ecosystem where we can all understand what we do uh, and make the best use of it. I think you know, what you've heard, actually, if I open this up the floor, is that we, you know, we've got probably two sides in one sense. We've got the very much the large SI that's utilising the, the SME for actually not only growing their business but bringing rapid ideas in and getting those to fruition quickly, uh, as well as uh, uh, Martin and I are actually using it to actually drive the transformation and probably taking more self-control back into the organisations we work for. I just want to open that up, if I may, to, to the floor here for, for some questions. In particular, I'm interested from the, if I may ask, from the SME side of things first, about how they actually feel that the market is, is working with them and how they're actually growing it. So, so can you just say who you are? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm Alex. I work for, um, in the startup community. Um, basically, what I wanted to ask is, you know, you're, you're kind of working with big businesses or you are big businesses. Is there any particular area or customer need or industry that um, you think uh, SMEs could really help with and it's like a struggle for big business at the moment? I think the problem I'll just go first is we don't know what we don't know. And part of the um, issues with being, if you like, in large organisations is you probably don't see further than your feet to some degree because that's the way organisations you know, have worked. So you know what you knew yesterday. Um, it's actually getting, what we've done, particularly in DVLA, because we've recognised that, is we've opened up more with the universities. And we've engaged with startup hubs, so Tech Hub, for example, in Swansea, to help us identify those things that we don't know we're doing, in effect. And I think it's those areas in particular for us, and exposing that, and then finding out some things which seem really obvious, to people like yourselves, because you're, trying, you're seeing the opportunity within a business you might consume. So in other words, for me, in DVLA, you, probably most people have vehicles, or I know people have got vehicles, and you see things that are actually happening with our organisation that you're not seeing us deliver the service for, and therefore you will see the opportunity. The question really is, how do you get that opportunity back to us, unless we are involved with the tech hubs and the universities of the world? As sort of one of the organisations that took on cloud services first in Wales, where we've noticed the gaps has been, for example, around tailoring uh, off-the-shelf cloud products to meet specific, perhaps, legislational or, or wider public sector needs. So, for example, making SharePoint do proper record keeping and disposals, so we meet the Public Records Act. Um, Customisation of CRM, that sort of thing. So it's the stuff around the edges of those generic cloud products, which the big players like Microsoft, etc., haven't yet produced and probably aren't all that interested in producing either. So it's those bespoke customizations of cloud, with, which is where the gap is still, in fact. Um, yeah, I've got answering that. We, we um, publish what we call Call for Innovation uh, on, a, on a website. We have a, an Edge website and we put out there um, a description of what it is, you know, a particular thing that, that we're looking for. Um, Co-Innovate, um, quick plug, happening at uh, 23rd, 24th of, of June. Um, ourselves and GE and Airbus are publishing our challenges there as well. So they are in the public domain, some of the things that we're looking to engage with people. 
Yeah, and I, and I think direct to answer your question, uh, um, yeah, government obviously um, are right across the board, um, massive opportunity for digital and, and, and for companies like yours. Uh, retail is obviously moving at a, at a ferocious pace and, and we're seeing more read across from, from the uh, digital solutions and companies that we're working with into government as well. Um, I, I think almost, well, yeah, especially with the internet of things, I, I think almost almost no industry, no area where, where companies like yours and, and digital transformation is, is not going to be the future. Got any more questions? So the back there. Uh, my name's Matt Shepley. Um, what do or, or what do you see um, it's more a question of a, a small SME being prepared to work with a larger company. What, what do you see as um, the, the kind of pitfalls that the smaller companies fall into in a, in a, in a sense that they're not being or not getting prepared enough um, to, to deal with larger companies? What, what are the problems you see usually when you deal with them? I'll open that to a large company, so if anyone do, do yeah. want to take that. So, so I, think, I think one of the things is, is a problem that's probably partly caused by us is that when Often, um, uh, technology companies come and talk to us about the tech, um, and, and that's probably because Capgemini, for example, spends a lot of time saying we're a technology company. Uh, I think one of the things we need to do is to drive out the business value of what it is you're delivering, because we have, tend to have longer-term um, uh, relationships with our clients, and so obviously they're interested in the business outcomes. Uh, and I think, in fairness, we lead companies like yours down the road of talking about your bit of tech, um, and then we can't really conceptualize where it fits. So I, I think one of the things, apart from making more effort to, to identify you, is then to ensure that when we have a discussion, it's centered around where does this fit within the overall digital business transformation rather than let's talk about your widget. Uh, and, I, and I think getting off on that right foot and understanding where it fits in the overall business value is, is something we've got to work with you to, to, to drive out. I absolutely agree. I, I think the putting myself in, in the shoes of a an SME who's delivering some technology, and it, it is extra, the technology is interesting, I'm a technologist, but f for the business to take it on, the question is, what is it gonna do for my customer? What problem are you solving, and how are you doing it? What, what, what is this technology making quicker, smaller, faster, lighter, or easier, or easier to train? What is the, the, the actual benefit of the technology? And I think if, because we have discussions and you know, we can go on to IP protocol stacks da, 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 till the cows come home, but our customer doesn't get that. He just knows that actually he just wants to be able to do something more simply or do that. So I think if we can extract to the business benefit or the customer benefit and have the technology level behind it to support that, I think that is often a, a pitfall. Um, and I think it helps when small companies need to grow and they need that next level of funding to be able to substantiate that business case in business terms rather than technology terms. Okay, look, I think uh, it's a good answer. I would only add, though, quickly on the, the uh, pitfall side is that you have to assume that every organisation is a selfish buyer. And what I mean by that is that we will go through our internal process for a long time, and then suddenly we'll leap on to you as SMEs and say, be here tomorrow with all your resources, all intact to do the job. Um, that's something that we have to learn. But when you talk about the pitfalls, that is certainly a pitfall for, uh, I've had um, small companies myself in the past. One of the pitfalls you find is you're putting a lot of effort into something that might be coming, that doesn't seem to come. You focus somewhere else, you're limited on resource. And then suddenly you find the previous person that was interested is really interested and wants you there with an army of people you don't have. And I think we have to understand that you're going to supplement the marketplace with other people and contractors yourself to help build that. But we need to actually work with you about giving you some kind of consolidation aspect. So proper engagement, proper contracts, and that landscape in which you can actually involve and develop. If we're truly looking at growing SMEs rather than consuming SMEs, I think that's what we've got to take on board. I think the, the other issue that we, we have experienced is overexposure to the market. So you'll get one contract, then suddenly two, three come along, and suddenly your resource pool is about this big when it needs to be about this big, um, which leaves your clients dissatisfied and gives you guys a bad reputation. And, that, and that's, I guess, is one of the biggest fears is you can be a victim of your own success. 
I'm just conscious of time, so just to, if there is one more question, I'll take it. Other than that, I will look to close up. Okay. Look, I'd like to, um, you know, obviously thank the panel. So Rob, Martin, and Matt. Uh, it's been a it's been a fun debate. I hope you have all got something from this and something to take away. I've, as to the SME community, I would encourage you to keep banging on the door, keep trying, keep striving, keep trying, innovate, but actually use the resources around you, things which are around, not just the organisations, but look towards the universities and startup areas to see if you can involve things through there as well. So I'd like to thank the panel, and uh, I think we're between you and lunch, so uh, we'll close off now. So thank you very much indeed.